Yeah, hi. Thank, thanks. Um, thanks, John. Um, can everybody, can you see me, John? And uh, can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you, Mark. Great. Um, okay, so just going to share my screen. I'll let you know Let's when I can see Just check to make sure we can see that. Yes, I can see your screen. You can see the screen? Okay, great. So um, let's uh, uh, let's start. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the webinar event, and uh, and thank you for spending the time to attend. And also, John, thank you also to HTN for hosting the event. Uh, my name is Mark Smith, and I'm delighted to be joined by my Novacom International Team colleague Sebastian Delacole, and our special customer guest Tony Tarpey, who's the head of clinical systems at the Wirral University Teaching Hospital NHS Foundation Trust and a really big thank you for him to support in the event today. The topic we will present is related to the value of strategic medical device integration with an example project case uh, and I will be your guide for the first part of this session which will take approximately 10 minutes. Um, this will include a brief summary of our company profile with details of the nature of our business and our customers across the world. Following that, I will help you understand why our solution called Patient Connect is so important in the current intensive care climate today, uh, discussing the issues that clinical staff face right now in these unprecedented times, as well as touching on the wider organizational concerns. Then I will swiftly hand over to Tony, who will take you through a project example at the Wirral, where they were looking for a solution that required a rapid deployment in critical care. Once Tony is finished, I will ask him a couple of questions about the project and then I'll hand you over to my international team colleague Seb who will focus his attention on the product itself. Please also be aware as John's already mentioned that you can send your own questions in at any time during the webinar uh, and by using the chat function and we will seek to answer these questions at the end of the session. Once Seb has finished I will return and between us as your host hope to answer the questions raised by you uh, the audience. And then I'll finally end with a summary of the main points of the session today, touching on the COVID-19 pandemic. So without any further delay, let's begin. Within the next 45 minutes or so, we'll provide our insight into how and why medical device interoperability is increasingly a priority for the intensive care unit, especially concerning COVID-19 pandemic. You will learn how quickly and creatively how a single interoperability platform can connect medical devices with any health IT system, such as electronic observation systems, EMRs, EPRs, and any clinical information system for that matter, uh, with a real example supported by the Wirral. The whole world is going through one of the most serious public health crises ever known, and the UK has not dodged a bullet either. Worse, it has been one of the most affected nations by the pandemic. All over the world, healthcare establishments have had to deal with an influx of patients never seen before. As the symptoms of the disease did not help, the resuscitation services of several establishments would have exceeded existing capacity without a flawless and rapid reorganization of those services to create new beds in intensive care units. And I'll expand on this with another case study example we've done with another customer in France a little bit later on. Although COVID-19 is not applicable in our story today with the Wirral, the importance of finding a solution to their problem did highlight an overcomes capability to move very quickly. And during this webinar, you will discover Wirral's story from the horse's mouth by working closely with the clinicians who led the project and the IT and biomedical teams, the trust were able to deliver against their objectives. But I will leave Tony to tell the full story a little bit later on. So what I want to do now is just literally just give you um, a sense of who we are and what we do to provide the comfort in the knowledge that we are experts in the field of interoperability. And Overcom was founded in 2002 and has 18 years experience as a software publisher providing best of breed interoperability data security access management and collaboration software which is dedicated 100% to the healthcare market. Our headquarters are based in Marseille in the south of France and we employ almost 200 people. In 2018, the company was acquired by Orange Business Services 
in recognition of a success that covers some 1,600 clients today. In our country of origin, we have a 50% share of the market and we operate internationally with a strong customer presence in Canada, the UK, the DAX and Benelux regions, with new customers coming on board in the Nordic regions, as well as many others dotted around the world, supported by a growing number of software vendor partners. So let's just talk about, in the next two slides, um, uh, this is a kind of combination of a discussion. I was speaking with my neighbor, Sarah, actually. And Sarah is a senior nurse working in ITU. And, and, and talking to her helped me to understand the issues she faces on a daily basis, both before and during the pandemic. The first one of these slides is representative of her issues before the pandemic situation. The first thing Sarah mentioned to me is the sheer increase in the number of admin tasks and paperwork she's having to do. And she has to move around to different departments to get the paperwork as it hasn't followed the patient through the system yet. In addition, as there is a shortage of staff as recruitment is difficult, she's having to pick up more work, which is creating more stress. And she does worry that mistakes are more likely to be made. And she says paperwork is regularly incomplete or missing. Then she talks about the technology that she and her team has to get to grips with using a variety of specialist applications that require time for training, whilst all the time trying to spend more time with her patients. In addition, as there are gaps in her staffing needs, agency nurses are used and they all need to be trained too, but these staff members are shared across departments. And then last but not least, Sarah's major worry is about manual transcription of her patient's vital signs, which needs to be taken regularly with an aging population. A lack of staff and demand just rising all the time, it's very easy to make an error that may have a detrimental effect on her patients. But then Sarah tells me about the terrible situation in this pandemic, where demand is through the roof and urgent organisational changes were needed that allowed them to be both as efficient as possible, which included rerouting patients both pre and post ITU, and then of course, as safe as possible how to keep her safe, staff stay from, uh, safe from harm. On the left-hand side of the screen, I listed the main points Sarah raised. She told me it was extremely important to be able to quickly set up the equipment and that patient data availability needed to be immediate. Being able to communicate with other colleagues, both upstream and downstream to smooth out patient flow, realizing every second would count. The team needed to ensure they had as little interaction with equipment to avoid any unnecessary spread of the infection, both in the unit and throughout the hospital. And then finally, she said to me, because the surge of the patients was so huge back in April and resources were limited due to self-isolating staff, they asked themselves, well, how much efficiency could they gain by automating the process? This situation is repeated in every ITU department in the country, and in fact, across the world. A case in point is a recent project with a hospital in France where St. Chalon sur Sion Hospital realised they needed to reconfigure medical devices and expand ITU capacity to meet the surge in demand of new COVID-19 patients. And they needed to do it very quickly and with as little interaction with those devices as possible to limit the spread of the, of the virus. And in fact, the full story of this uh, case study will be presented in another webinar on the 30th of June by the hospital team. In the HSJ, it reported last month from an article written by the Royal College of Physicians that one-fifth of medical staff are currently on sick leave due to COVID-19, with one in four doctors self-isolating in the UK right now. When resources are this thin, it is imperative to turn to technology and automating the processes of capturing, validating and exchanging information as quickly as possible. I think you'll agree the example of COVID-19 patients' clinical support needs on the right-hand side of the slide demonstrates very well the amount of tasks for just one patient's record of care, especially if this information is collected on paper and manually transcribed. In such a pressurised environment, mistakes are very likely. It also highlights the variety of data sources, the importance of timing of decisions and the sharing of information to try and optimise the flow of patients through the hospital setting, either upstream and downstream. When we consider this example and then multiply this to include other sick patients on top, 
then you start to realise the massive impact our solution has for healthcare professionals in easing the burden of an already exhausted workforce. But then Sarah explained to me that, of course, ventilation is a key piece of equipment to use against COVID-19. But we need to be aware that it's not just connecting the device that is important. Some patients will react differently to others, and therefore the continuous monitoring of the patient condition may be crucial. Adding continuous surveillance to the ventilator workflow can aid clinicians with data that helps them to assess the possible onset of respiratory distress. In addition, this enables staff to be less exposed to risk of infection as their movements around the patient equipment and the unit are limited. And finally, just sending the data somewhere isn't enough either. All the different data points need to be easily interpreted by clinicians. It has to appear exactly as the EPR needs to receive it. This data could be large and come from a variety of sources of devices, and not all data will be sent to the same place in the EPR. Our ability to configure the data was one of the key benefits that one of our customers here in the UK, the Wirral Hospital, recognised. And that leads very nicely for me to hand over to Tony, who will take up the story. Tony, over to you. Okay, let me just uh, show you my lockdown look. Um, put the camera on. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, new one for me after 43 years service in the uh, NHS to be locked down for the best part of 12 weeks and doing webinars. Um, quite interested in the past 12 weeks with COVID. Uh, we've never seen anything like it in the health service. I'm sure everyone agrees. And my association with Novacom started uh, a long time before um, the COVID crisis. But just pick it up on a couple of comments from what Mark has just said, is we are moving into a new normal. The aim of, of Wirral Hospital for the past uh, five to 10 years has to be come paper light. Uh, and there's been a lot of resistance um, from clinicians. Um, but to give you an example, over the past uh, eight, 10 weeks, we've gone from a 90% of patients turning up to outpatients um, at the hospital to 80 to 90% being remotely dealt with either by telephone or video. So I truly think that we're seeing the end of uh, paper case notes, paper traces, paper reports, the big uh, sheets of paper that you record, ITU recordings because only yesterday Waterstones reopened. And if you touch a book, it has to go into quarantine for 72 hours. How will this work in an environment where you're passing around sheets of paper and case notes? One of the other things I just pick up on, on Mark's um, discuss, discussion about COVID is we're also seeing certainly transfers of patients outside of the acute trust two centers that can prov provide ECMO and by having a single patient record that is fully digital you're pa you can pass on a full digital record to the the uh, following hospital rather than um, pages and pages of legible uh, case notes okay so what what are we all uh, we're all have been one of the leads in UK uh, IT sites for over 30, 40 years now. We've had e-prescribing for over 30 years as one of the first six um, sites that went with a hospital information system towards the end of the 70s. Um, we, are, we are quite bu busy and um, we've been quite busy with uh, COVID as well as the Northwest has been one of this the areas that have um, been hit the most. Wirral is also quite a um, wide raging social um, county. We've got poverty and we've got um, some of the poorest wards, which as we know are, are markers for COVID. 
Um, for those in the UK, we were invited to be a global digital exemplar, and that gave us money to um, move towards our model, which in the context of this talk was to have a fully integrated um, ITU, theatres, um, cardiac, etc., all part of the electronic record. Um, and I, we won an award called Chime that's on, on the wall of the office uh, that we no longer visit. Can I have the next slide, please, Mark? Next slide. Okay. One of the, can we go back one, please? Okay, so one of the things I just wanted to pick up, I'm not quite sure of the audience, um, my background was biochemistry and, and informatics. I also, for a couple of years, as in my informatics role, looked after what was our biomedical engineering team. Um, but the idea of full integration is, is relatively new into an EPR. And certainly there's some confusion between the regulatory bodies around uh, the Medical Device Agency and NHS Digital. So, for instance, who is responsible for a medical device? Um, who can touch the software of a medical device? Um, it's fairly easy if you're looking at the calibration side of, of that that would fall within um, your biomedical engineering. But what about the ports and the connectivity and the software settings and the IP settings, etc.? So it's just a consideration. Luckily, because we've got a culture of um, of trying to be electronic, we had good relationships and we continue to have good relationships with our uh, colleagues in biomedical engineering. But it also has an impact in how you set up your support. So once upon a time in theatres, they would say a ventilator isn't working. And the biomedical engineer would turn up and see what was wrong. Now, if they say it's not working, it's is it the device? Is it the network? Is it the receiving system? In our case, Cerner Millennium. I've got to cover off um, how important it is within the organization that in any business plan for new equipment that you think about how you're going to connect that to uh, a digital record. And certainly in our hospital, all business cases for equipment have to uh, have IT approval and all um, major devices. One of the uh, specifications that we ask for is have you got, can you connect to Cerner Millennium and we'll, and we'll pick up on that later. I've mentioned how you need to think about support within your organization, the hours that you support. Um, once you've got fully integrated systems, the nine to five model doesn't necessarily work. Um, you have to think of 24 seven within your own organization. And you also have to think of how do you best get, gather that support from a, a third party supplier? Are you gonna go with is nine to five uh, sufficient Monday to Friday? Or do you need to look for um, greater support um, so it's quite within a couple of months of people moving to this sort of inter integration it, it becomes essential the idea of going back to pen and paper is, is not something that you can do so next slide please mark as i was just working on some a business case last week i, I just thought i'd share um some data from a, a legacy system in cardiology um, where they assured me and and they are very careful about how they manually enter the data versus the data that we have on our EPR which is is the master so it, we had in total we've got 40,000 odd patients and as you can see if you go for the the best match of medical record number surname first name and gender we've got a 40% 41% match rate, not very good, I would argue. Some things are, are, are silly, like gender mismatch. Carol is recorded as a, as a male. Um, 
some are Robin Williams, William Robin. They're quite low percentages, but for that patient record, that's quite important if, if we can't find um, Robin William on, on the legacy system because he's called William Robin. Date of birth um, mismatches again. Um, the legacy, you can see they've got, um, it's uh, the 26th of um, the month and the EPR says it's the 25th. Minor things, but when we go fully electronic, any messages that we sent to the, uh, from the EPR to the new cardiology system would fail because date of birth mismatch. Date of birth is one of the key um, identifiers. And then interestingly, in some ways, the MRN mismatch is quite low, which shows, to, shows me that people are a lot more careful about typing in the MRN um, than maybe some of the other data. So that's just, that came out because there was a business case for a, a new full lung study um, kit that will be in use for 10 years. They said, we don't really need integration. We'll just um, scan the paper into into uh, the records. But we were able to convince the organization by showing them this, that one, all that scanning is for 10 years is, um, is a waste of resource. And two, imagine the consequences in a medical legal case or a coroner if we've got a data, mis data birth mismatch or an MRM mismatch across two systems that are being used to treat that patient. So that's just one of the recent um, cases I've been dealing with. Next slide, please. So just I'll just skip over this. So uh, 1990, we went live with e-prescribing. Um, started um, a project with an overcome in 2018. Um, in 2017, we went fully uh, integrated for all theater equipment, um, all intensive care, um, all monitored units in ED, uh, with the exclusion of the neonatal unit. And uh, if someone wants to ask me a question, I can answer that later on. Um, next slide, please. So, why is interoperability important? Well, patients will receive the best, safest, the most comprehensive care if clinicians responsible for their care have access to the record that is current, comprehensive, and relative. Um, Mark mentioned the number of uh, medical staff who are either shielding or isolating away from the workforce. Uh, over the past 12 weeks, we regularly have two to 3,000 members of staff um, not all clinicians who are accessing the system remotely. Um, they can write notes, they can review patients, um, and certainly consultants um, on call uh, will use uh, VPN to look at the total patient records, including the latest vital signs and uh, ventilator settings. Next. Okay, so how did we get involved with um, an overcome? Well, basically, uh, intensive care had some, bought some new ventilators. Um, and at that time, we didn't have the full sign out. Um, they needed integrating into the trust EPR and all the benefits that uh, Sarah brought up with marker there, it's time saving, added safety, you're not passing paper around, you're not necessarily moving from bedsides. Um, and so we, 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 um, we had an issue where our current um, supplier, Cerna Millennium, could not connect to these new uh, Mac A devices, even though as part of their OBS response, they had said that they could. As you can see there, there's been some very complimentary feedback from uh, an overcome for the project. Um, and I would say that 18 months in, 
it's been successful merely by the the point that I don't hear anything about these this integration. It's just used and doesn't break down, and people aren't um, are well used to it. Next slide, please. So device integration. I know we're concentrating to some extent on ICU and and ventilation, but within our organisation, it's obviously all devices that can be integrated. There are some devices um, that can't be integrated um, because they don't have um, the ability to take in patient um, names, etc. But we're also looking at ECG across um, two platforms. We've got 300 Welsh Allen Vital Signs uh, mobile devices. I uh, mentioned that all of theatres are fully integrated. Um, ventilators are fully integrated. And we are starting a project for uh, infusion pumps outbound into the um, patient record to help with uh, fluid balance. We're not quite brave enough to go with a, a two-way um, infusion pump. And, and we will start that in the neonatal unit where a huge amount of time is spent uh, with highly specialised nurses sitting next to infusion pumps, noting down the regions. The benefits I've touched on, a single electronic patient record that can be shared digitally. Uh, no uh, misplacement of uh, decimal points or sevens looking like ones. Um, because we're putting ventilator data, vital signs data, laboratory data, um, even uh, antibiotic data into the same system. You can start creating rules. So we've got real-time rules that will warn of sepsis and having everything in a single place saves clinician nursing time. Next. Okay, so Mark just wants me to talk about the bottom one, but I'm going to talk about the, the three. Um, there are three ways to connect medical devices, and um, we actually use all three. So we can go direct to the EPR via Therna in our case. Um, it requires them having a driver developed, um, and there's a three month lead time into any uh, project and the libraries are largely driven from the US um, can be expensive and it, it is point to point so you'll have a connectivity engine on one end of your um, anesthesia device that points directly into Cerner. You can use a medical device supplier. So we have a Draeger gateway that we use for a number of the vital signs, which means that a patient, we can track a patient um, through ED, theatres, ITU, and onto the wards, um, sharing that information using Draeger. And indeed, it was this mechanism that we used earlier on uh, with the earlier version of MAC-A uh, ventilators that we had in use. It, it, they actually connected via Draeger. Um, but obviously, Draeger and mac -A are competitors in this market. And when we approached Draeger to see if they would uh, connect the new mac -A devices, the answer was a firm no. It would be several years in the future, which was disappointed since we'd spent several hundred thousand pounds on this new kit. So from my lab background, I had a good, I had a understanding of using third parties there for a lot of the device integration. I Personally, I'd never heard of um, sort of a, a third party solution such as an Overcom. And it was one of the hits when something just happened to cross my desk saying, is this of any interest? Um, and so I started a, a relation with an Overcom. Uh, specifically around these initial ventilators, but also with an eye to a future because we've now purchased the um, the hardware to run and overcome, um, but we've also purchased access 
to drive us now and in the future and and certainly one of my considerations when covid started and everyone was desperately looking for ventilators uh, which happily we didn't need in the end was if they do come and they're not one of the supported ones by our primary supplier or or our or Draeger, how would we get connected because there would no there'd be no way that in our organization we could have some ventilators running in a digital mode and some going back to a paper mode it would just be unsafe um so that was um one of the reasons that we went with an overcome next slide mark so sorry i'm just um going over the story there um so we needed to get the new equipment commissioned and we needed to get it deployed rapidly um and on that basis um we we contracted with an overcome to deliver the required integration next one so the one of the great advantages is of using either Cerner or, or Draeger is, is the usability. It doesn't add to a user workload. They don't need to log on to another device and another system. Um, and so key to our requirements was the fact that we weren't adding on to the workload of the intensive care staff. Clearly in critical care, it's a 24 seven 365 day service uh, we had stability and we needed stability going forward um, at this time I always look for wood um, you can't have a system that is not stable in ITU that even drops for an hour or two hours um, it just the unit is not set up to um, go back to paper it also had to become uh, flex flexible and, and certainly an overcome learnt along with us. So initially, I think the machines send out data every one minute, which obviously isn't benefit doesn't benefit an EPR. Uh, so I think we settled on hourly, which was what we'd previously done. But then there's the need to um, send data ad hoc if there's a change in the patient's uh, condition or a change on the ventilator settings. Um, also, there was a requirement to sometimes remove data because um, one of the sensors had, had fallen off at the when we were collecting the data or the patient had moved. So these were all considerations that weren't part of our original discussions, but were things that were evolved as the project went on. and. Uh, Certainly working with some of the key uh, and overcom staff um, they dealt with um, very responsibly and 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 delivered um, changes to our original requirements without any um, real uh, discussions um, I wasn't aware of all the display and mapping issues around um, medical devices and um, Certainly, there was expertise there with an overcome. I'm just pulling up here a slide. I, I don't know how clear it is, but this is um, our flow sheet setting for um, critical care. And you can see along there, if you look very carefully, that we've got things like uh, respiratory rate, um, ventilator settings, etc. Um, as you can see, that's quite cluttered. So what we actually do is we we turn them into what we call an M page. Next slide, Mark. So you see here the M page is is configurable by the user, and it contains um, everything that you would need to review an intensive care patient. Latest lab results, current respirator settings. You can open tabs to look at latest meds micro reports, etc. So again, this is key to um, usability and success of uh, integration. Next slide, please. So I mentioned earlier how it had to be usable. We didn't want people having to log into an overcome. So effectively, this is once a patient arrives on the unit, 
um, they click the button for an overcome. Next uh, slide, Mark. So we use the, we don't ask them to log into an Overcom because they've already logged into the EPR. So we pass through the um, security and at this point they will um, associate one of the um, ventilators to the patient. Literally takes less than a, a minute. Next slide. So once they're connected to the device, exactly what we've we've seen um, carries on and then at the end of the session um, when the patient leaves the unit um, they dissociate the device it falls back into the pool for use for, an, for another patient so mostly virtually other than clicking that an overcome button under the top of the EPR and associating the device the user has seen nothing different um, to the way they normally worked so it has been successful, it's continued to be successful. Uh, we we had resistance when we first mentioned an overcome because people were used to just use a millennium, but now it's easy to use. The patient data is exactly as required in the EPR. That was a another um, change in requirements as we, we shared the bills with um, clinicians and nurses. I've mentioned that we've future-proofed um, some of our future investment requirements because we, um, one, we can easily make changes if we need to collect more ventilator settings because we only use um, a set number for the clinicians. So that would just be a simple support call with an overcome. Um, but equally, if we get other devices, we can um, look to which is the best route to connect them. Um, whether through an overcome or, or through one of the other routes. And I should really have this to hand, but we also, there's a GDE blueprint, which covers some of the uh, wider um, integration points that I've sort of rushed by in this presentation. And I think that's the final slide, is it, Mark? Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, uh, I've just got a quick question, actually, if you don't mind. Um, sure. But thanks for giving us the details of that. And uh, one of the questions I've got is, what were the challenges of clinical staff adopting the technology? Well, the, the challenge was that challenge I've said, that um, they'd already had a seamless process, uh, which on, on the older ventilators, where they still had to associate a ventilator to a patient. Um, and they did not want to have to um, log into another system, uh, follow a, a long process. I should have mentioned in that drop down, they pick up the patient from, from the, the ADT interface as well. Um, and the fact that actually from a displaying on the system, it, it looks exactly as it did prior to um, the new ventilators. I, I tell you now, if if the system is is running slow, which isn't very often, or um, if we have to have a downtime for some um, maintenance, it is so hard to um, get that space. And and again, coming back, there is no way they would go back to those huge white sheets of paper where they'd uh, note down all these ventilator settings. So it's it's a huge waste of uh, expensive nurse and staff resources, which is why we're doing the work in in neonatal next. Okay, well, th thanks for that, Tony. Um, I'm just um, going to now sort of uh, remind everyone that you can write a question um, using the func using the chat function, and we'll answer that at the end of the webinar. Uh, but now it's time to turn our attention to the product itself, and for that, I will hand you over to Seb. Um, Seb, I'll just make you the presenter. Um, yeah. And you should now have control now. Yeah? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay. Well, uh, hello, hello everyone. Thank you, Mark. Um, I I will tell you a, a story, a story that didn't happen to any of you in your hospital. Um, I propose to present issues around nurse staff 
and how patient connect can be used to improve a nurse daily work routine. So let's open your hospital doors like we've done with wireless doors and see the situation through Sarah's eyes. Sarah knows the hospital and everything around the world look. She's always ready to find a new, uh, to, to find a solution to improve the patient's care. And uh, know that manual data reporting is not a valuable task. I will talk um, about Dave and Andrew because they are directly linked with Sarah's work. Um, Dave, as an IT administrator, helps Sarah uh, if she has trouble with, uh, for example, a Windows password, etc. And I will talk about Andrew um, as a biomedical engineer who will be involved in the project. It would be nice for Sarah to avoid manual vitals writing and reporting to the EHR. Thanks to this time saving, she could take more time for a break, reduce her stress, um, take more time for patient care. Let's see the situation now. Um, uh, to resume the main point of patient care, the patient arrives, um, Sarah would check details about the patient, um, reading uh, his record, and then um, she will assume the patient's monitoring. She will regularly watch for him and report vitals inside the EHR. Uh, the report is done manually and um, is crucial for the doctor in charge of Sarah's patient. Thanks to those vitals, he will be able to make the best decision to adapt the treatment uh, in order to maintain or improve the, the health of the patient. If vitals are reported at the right time, the care can be improved. The patient can leave the ward sooner. Um, then the doctor, um, by reading the health evolution of the patient uh, through data reports and communication with Sarah, can analyze the situation and make a decision. Finally, the patient can be discharged from the ward. Sarah knows that her actions, even if it's boring, are crucial for a patient's care episode, as the doctor needs vital information to take the best decision. Now, let's focus on Sarah's uh, reporting task. Currently, she has many actions to do, um, concerned with the retrieval of data in the EHR. These operations are time consuming. First, Sarah accesses the room, performs very care task for the patient. Then she reads um, she reads devices and verifies that everything is okay. Then she writes uh, vitals on the support like a, a sheet of paper and report them into the EHR. Moreover, Sarah knows that she has to do this for more than one patient. So um, she prefers going through each room before retrieving vitals um, as there is not one computer per room, but a few computers in the wall hall hallway. Finally, once in front of the computer, Sarah accesses the EHR and reports, and reports vitals. But because of her workflow, there is a delay between the vital collection and reporting it at the EHR. She can also be disturbed by other nurses during her, um, her vital um, re retrieving, so pot potentially leading to a reporting error as Sarah is not focused on her task. So this manual data retrieving can be a source of frustration for her, um, a non-added value, and she would like to save this time for other actions, for example, for more valuable um, tasks like a research project. And keep in mind that uh, Sarah's action has an impact for the doctor. He must analyze uh, vitals and depends on Sarah's accuracy of vital stem collection to take the best decision. So the um, doctor review vitals inside the, the EHR and uh, decide whether to adapt the treatment or discharge the patient. If Sarah reports vitals uh, lately, the decision can be delayed. Maybe the patient's health can deteriorate, and even worse, 
because of the time gap between device consulting and vitals reporting. The treatment is not well adjusted, and even worse, and it can um, it can postpone the patient leaving. If the vitals are not present as expected on the EHR, the doctor has no idea of the patient condition and could decide to gather information directly on the spot, losing valuable time and space. Consequently, Sarah knows she loses time with manual report and make transcription errors. However, this workflow added to manual reporting introduces risk indirectly for the patient because of a late and unoptimal decision as the doctor does not have all the right vitals at the right time. It's, uh, it's as important as for COVID-19 patients because uh, we have to check um, combined vitals to, to give the best care and avoid hypoxia. If uh, a patient has hypoxia, he has to be uh, intubated. So it, uh, it, seem, it um, needs um, more intensive treatment and um, medication to avoid patient pain and further infection. If the patient needs closer care, the doctor will not wait for a late report and may need to go inside the ward, which, be, which uh, may not be necessary if he had time, uh, he, if he had, sorry, data on time. But Sarah can be blamed for that with a hard work and frenzy pace. That's why she needs a solution to open manual reports and ret retrieve automatically and without delay um, any vital and send them to the EHR. Let's see the situation with patient connect. It's exactly the same for the patient care, but um, Sarah will have to associate the patient. This, um, this association, it, we will see it in a few slides, is really easy and fast. Then, thanks to this, this uh, association sequence, data will be collected and sent automatically to the uh, EHR. So she will gain a lot of time. She, she could better manage her patient, extend her very short lunch, or can, uh, she will be able to do uh, any task presenting added value. Once the patient associated to the devices through Patient Connect, manual transcription will not be necessary for Sarah. She would just need maybe to add manual measurements inside the, the device and uh, they will be sent automatically to the EHR. And if needed, she will check vitals directly on the EHR. With time saved, she can decide to report more data from devices because when she had to do this manually, uh, she didn't have enough time to uh, take many vitals. But now, thanks to automatic um, collection of data. She just has to, to ask for new vitals, and when it's done, she does not have any operation um, to do to, uh, to send those new data to the EHR. For the, for the doctor, it's, it's exactly the same uh, way of work, but the difference is inside the quality of information because. Um, thanks to those automatically sent data and um, sent with a certain frequency, um, he can administer treatment more, more adapted to the patient, and he is able to even anticipate this evolution. He doesn't need to see Sarah to ask for patient vitals, both save time. Finally, with this brand new workflow adapted for Sarah, Innova Compassion Connect makes work easier uh, through automatic data collection. First, she doesn't need to manually report data, so she saves time and data transcription errors are avoided. Secondly, data are sent to the EHR with a specific frequency as wanted by Sarah and the doctor work, working with her. Therefore, 
trends of patient health can be easily observed with different graphs. Thirdly, quality of care is improved. The data is received at the right time, enabling a preset treatment adjustment. Finally, Sarah gains valuable time for other activities. So let's focus on Sarah's action to activate automatic data collection to another patient connect. For a patient, Sarah needs to access to the patient record in the EHR. From this point, there are two possibilities. An integration with the EHR, as uh, previously seen, or without connection, Sarah will just have to connect inside Patient Connect. And in those two cases, she arrives to the association window right here. Once in the association window, she will, choose, she will see the patient with his demographic information and um, each device that can be linked to the patient. She selects the, um, the device she wants to associate to the patient. She just has to click on the button corresponding to the device. And then the device is pre-associated. Once each device is are selected, she can click on the Save button. The Save button will enable the start of the association and the data collection. If needed, she can come back to this uh, window and two um, buttons are available on the left side of the patient. The first is a clock um, corresponding to the frequency rate, to the frequency um, of the data retrieving collection. So you can change it uh, as, uh, as you want. Uh, all those information are uh, previously um, um, sure, chosen by the nurse. And the second uh, button, the, the screen one, refers to the direct uh, vital sending. It means that if the nurse click on the button, data are the, uh, the last received data are sent to the EHR. That's all. Sarah uh, does not have any other action to do to associate the patient. So in, as, we, as we see, with only a few clicks, we do not have any other info, uh, action to do to uh, collect data. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's see for Dave and Andrew um, what they need to uh, what they they want for the project. Dave and Andrew are involved in the project team and I have a few questions about Novacom Patient Connect. Andrew, as a biomedical en engineer, constantly needs to renew his biomedical device pool. In this situation, he knows that replacing devices um, for what could be from different manufacturers than previously. Then he uses a solution that allows connection with an end device model from any manufacturer. On his side, side, Dave, as an IT administrator, considers also many things, as for instance, uh, words exchange information, but software language is not generic. We need to, to provide data from devices to one or more than one software. Consequently, uh, it would be perfect for maintenance if only one solution could collect data and send them to different software systems. Second point, uh, those different software solutions have their own specifications to accept data. Other questions are asked by um, Andrew and Dave, but to resume um, the answer, we have two main principles. Through this third party software solution, Patient Connect proposes, on the one hand, a real library of drivers in order to collect data from any kind of medical devices and any model. Uh, through a manufacturer's neutral solution, we are working with, that, with them to get the latest version of their communication protocol and then propose data collection from their medical devices. That information is structured in a standardized format, H7 ORU. On the other hand, Patient Connect proposes an interoperability platform, meaning that we can send this structured data um, from devices to any medical software able to integrate them. 
depending on the specification, another compression connect can adapt structured data in specific format as expected by medical software. So consequently, uh, Andrew and Dave understand the, the solution and um, for Andrew, uh, he does not have to worry about future medical device acquisition. And Dave knows that it would be possible to send vitals, vitals automatically to any medical software and integrate them regardless of the format expected from the medical software. I just will end my presentation with alarm management. So alarm management um, is available and allows physical, uh, physiological um, alarms to be sent to an, any alarm management system. Sarah will uh, receive um, an SMS on her phone to be uh, to be alarmed that there's a problem inside a patient's room. And to go further, there are technical alarms that it can be sent to um, to Andrew, the biomedical the biomedical engineer. Why? Because uh, he can uh, collect these technical alarms and uh, enhance his maintenance work and better predict. Uh, prevent, preventive maintenance to reduce cost by being more proactive. So, as a conclusion, um, Patient Connect as a third party, party software solution can greatly reduce nursing time by automatic data collection from any kind of device. This neutral manufacturer and medical software solution can send H7 ORU structured data as expected to any medical software such, such as EHR through this interoperability platform. Added to automatic data collection, alarms can be also collected to be exploited by nursing, nursing staff or biomedical staff. That's all for me. Thanks for your attention.